kind of ready to do that to begin with. So, uh, you know, both EMC and GSD have been sort of uh, occupied with implementations of models. I do see a little bit more of a window opening up after, certainly from our office as we get things in, to start to try to look at this a little bit more. So, Andy, I take that as your willingness to participate even in a dialed down uh, uh, looking at uh, experimental RUA, is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, Jeff, tell me when to advance the slides. You're up. Okay, next slide. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk about RTMA and IRMA, and uh, as this slide indicates, along with the names of the, the team members. Um, all of which I, I do note are non-federal employees, so uh, take that for what you will. I mean, we do have uh, feds that work on observations and quality control, but in terms of those that work on RTMA and IRMA, it's, it, it ends up being, except for Yinglin, uh, it, it, it's, they're all uh, contractors. So whether it's RUA, analysis of record, some new acronym, or the existing RTMA and IRMA, there's a need to do both, something in real time and something in delay time, um, unfortunately. And that is consistent with the original plans uh, way back when, where we had a three-phased uh, proposal or, or plan to do real-time mesoscale analysis initially, do an improved analysis, which we would consider good enough for uh, verification, or which we would then label the analysis of record. And then once we were happy with that, we would run it for the last 30 years and, uh, and produce a reanalysis. Uh, we're not quite getting to the point where uh, the, the way that we wanted to, but we're, we're making progress. So go ahead and move to the next slide, Amy. So the, uh, this is just an informational slide that talks about where we're at. Uh, mostly because there's two links at the bottom to the last couple of uh, change control board briefings that Manuel or Steve Levine had done on the RTMA IRMA upgrades. Uh, you know, we are running for CONUS and OCONUS, so we do Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and Guam um, at two and a half kilometers or so for the most part. Uh, we use a combination of uh, Actually, GFS and NAM and RAP and HER for the backgrounds. Um, and we do use the grid point statistical interpolation, which is also being used in all of those modeling systems, uh, as well as in RTMA IRMA. The difference is that we apply it in a two dimensional mode uh, for RTMA IRMA, which is uh, quite affordable. We use a full set of observations, conventional surface. Uh, and the satellite observations of primarily over the ocean for near-surface winds. At the moment, we don't use radar data because this is largely a surface analysis. And that's, you know, we'll, that will be addressed as we move to three dimensions. Uh, next slide. So the, uh, the next slide, again, is some more links to how you, you can view the RTMA IRMA. The top one is the what we affectionately call Louie's web page. It's the model analysis and guidance page that um, he's always looking at, and it's produced by NCO, Central Operations. Uh, the next pair are done, developed, and, and run here by the developers for the RTMA and the IRMA, uh, Steve Levines and, and, and others produced that. And then there's the most excellent MDL internet viewer uh, which is linked there and, and is shown an example on the lower right with the quad, the four panel charts, which are, are really good for looking at uh, and comparing results, uh, not only for the analysis, but also for the national blend. Um, let's move on to the next slide, which is the new thing that Steve Levine has set up, which is the VLAB, uh, or will be, I'm sorry, I'm off by one slide. So this is just talking about the connections that we um, take advantage of, which we consider to be vital, that is connecting to the users, the, the forecasters, the SUs. We have monthly conference calls. Uh, uh, sometimes we'll have to cancel them when we have an implementation, but we, we still move forward with them as often as we can. They provide us with critical information uh, and examples that we can work on to make things better. 
Um, we've done multiple briefings to the to regions, and we've recently uh, started an additional collaborations as a result of the pseudo workshop. And the next slide is the uh, example for the uh, the V Lab that Steve Levine has been beginning to work with. So it's it's similar. This is where you get into V Lab and you go to the lower left and click, or at least in my lower left. There's the RTMA IRMA Evaluation Feedback Group. And if you click on that next slide, you get uh, this slide with all sorts of uh, information. It's got the parallel links if you want to do uh, download the actual grids. Uh, and it has lots of other information in there. And I expect that we'll move away from what now appears to be a fairly crude list server, which is what got us uh, uh, to the point where we are today. Uh, and, and take more and more advantage of this new tool, the, the VLAB tool. Uh, the next slide, I'm just going to jump into pretty much word slides and talk about future plans that we're, we're taking in the, in the fairly near term to improve the product. And observational quality control is always going to be high on the list. Uh, and here it is, the first on the list. So we, we have proceeded with turning on some of the Variational quality control. This is what I call an ultimate buddy check. It's performed within the GSI. So all of the observations uh, that are included are used in this uh, variational quality control, sort of a consistency check. In, the, in, in a lot of other processing at NCEP, we do platform-specific quality control, where we only compare observations with neighboring values of a similar type. Here we're using observations of all types compared to each other in the using the strength of the variational solution. Uh, the next bullet talks about a temporal consistency check we've been waiting to get from the uh, highway department's Claris, which is being implemented by Matus. Uh, we also have some processing by Ms. Sue, uh, who is working with the global uh, started working with the global data simulation group in the Joint Center and is now applying these the same monitoring capability to the regional. Uh, so looking at statistics of uh, over a fairly long period of time, let's just say 90 days from 30 to 90 days, uh, we can look at uh, stations that are having problems and that are more subtle and would fall between the cracks of any gross checks or even the buddy checks. Uh, so we, we can identify those and put them on a reject list. Our current plan in terms of operating or uh, implementing this is to run this essentially every day so that the, the, the reject list would be changing on a daily basis and we wouldn't have to worry about putting something on the reject list and then having it sit there for 30 or 90 days when it really should be taken off, et cetera. Now that work will also include uh, comparisons to try to estimate a bias that we uh, if we feel confident, we can apply to the observations. And I believe it will also lead to us doing a better job of doing site-specific observation error uh, specification or modulation, in, as I've said here. Now, on that same topic, we recently had a discussion with the SUS uh, on, uh, I have a topic about that later, about doing a, uh, a white paper on how good is good enough. Um, and in that context, doing background work, Dave Bernhardt did a really good job surveying the, uh, the observations and their sources. Uh, there's a couple of questions here in the smaller print, so, but let's move on to the next slide. I've just uh, taken the, his, four of his tables and lumped them in here. In the upper left is the temperature uh, sensors of, uh, in the orange background. And you can see there's quite a variety. Uh, in the upper right, uh, similar variety there for the dew point sensors. Lower left is the wind, and the lower right is the rain gauge. Now, I do want to point out that we don't do a variational analysis of the rain gauge data, uh, but it, it's, it was uh, interesting to see this in, the, in Dave's analysis. So for temperature, dew point, and wind, you can see all this interesting information that varies by sensor. Now, at the moment, the GSI distinguishes observation types of only two types. There's the METARs, or SAOs, SYNOPs, are in the same category, and mesonets. So when we specify an observation error, there are two degrees of freedom. 
is either the METAR value or the mesonet value. Mesonet values are, are higher, higher observation error than the METARs. Now, in a future world, we definitely want to build in the modulation around using information like this that Dave has gathered so we can take look at individual sensors. This information is recorded in metadata databases, and we need to bring that into the GSI uh, so we can make decisions or set observation errors appropriately. Was there a question? Okay, guess not. Next slide. Okay, the uh, uh, Stan alluded to this is there are moves afoot to, to do the RTMA more frequently than hourly. Uh, there are uh, he's identified some of those users for, for the short term, the near term, our drivers are primarily aviation users. Uh, we do have the, the folks at Lincoln Labs that run COSPA. Uh, they use a an analysis every 15 minutes to look for boundaries and intersections where convection is likely to initiate. Uh, at the moment, they're using a lapse type analysis, but the hope is if that is be going to become operational, it will be using either the RTMA or an RUA uh, analysis. Uh, th there's a clear focus from the aviation point of view of, on ceiling and visibility, and especially the helicopter emergency medical services, that's misspelled, sorry, um, and support known as HEMS, which runs out in Kansas City at AWC. Uh, so we have, under an FAA project, committed to move to do ceiling visibility for CONUS at least through uh, by the end of 16, every 15 minutes, and then uh, enhance that to every 10 minutes by the end of 17, uh, which is beyond my event horizon, meaning I will be retired by then. Uh, and then in 2018, uh, every five minutes. That, that last bit hasn't been funded, but we're hopeful. So that's just for the, for the RTMA sense. Um, and if we could do that with an RUA, we, we, and I would agree with Stan that we would do a better job with the ceiling uh, doing that with a three-dimensional analysis than what we're currently doing with a two-dimensional analysis. One thing I did not put in here, which I think is exciting, is that in Alaska, which, and we do intend to move all of this to, uh, to Alaska, not just CONUS, um, there are about 1,000 cameras that have been installed by the FAA, and there are people uh, in the research world, Lincoln Labs, uh, NCAR, I'm leaving someone out that are working on processing that imagery and producing observations of ceiling and visibility uh, that will en enhance our ability to uh, the, of the observation density in Alaska where things are are poor in terms of the amount of data. So I just wanted to mention that I, I should have put in a slide, but I didn't get to it. So uh, next slide, Amy. Okay, so. It, following up, continuing the aviation support end of things, we currently have taken advantage for the FAA and uh, the Airlines for America group. We produce a, a, a text product from every RTMA analysis um, at certain airports. Uh, and these temperatures are used um, in lieu of missing reports or, or if, if for some reason the instrument is down or there's some other problem and the temperature isn't available, current regulations require that temperature to be available in order for airlines and, and, and other parts of the uh, industry to function, to, for the airports to remain open. So in the past, those airports had to suspend operations until they got a temperature from a valid uh, source. The FAA has allowed the RTMA to be used as a valid source. So this, uh, this got lots of kudos from the, the A4A group uh, to the FAA, who had relaxed their, their requirements, and to the RTMA group for being able to produce that. Now, as we all expected, the FAA is now interested in additional variables at those airports in that text file. So we've recently had a meeting, and they've expressed a strong interest in what is the accuracy of our analyses. And we pointed out that we make an estimated analysis field, uh, that, that we have been doing that from all of the analysis that have been produced by the 2D VAR, uh, and that is distributed out on AWITS. So we talked a lot about that. 
and how we might make it better. Uh, in addition, we recently had a meeting with the RTMA Sioux team that are drafting a white paper on what is good enough in the context of the RTMA analyses. Um, and and I, I think in the context of what are the, in, their use to define the, the, the uh, era level of forecasts. Uh, and there was a lot of interest there as well in the estimated analysis uncertainty that we produce. So we have two things for sure that we'll be doing to improve that estimate. One is this I've already talked about, which is we'll be putting in a lot more observation error variability, following up on Dave's uh, analysis of sensors. Uh, and we'll be probably putting that in, if not this year, then certainly the first uh, upgrade next year. Uh, we are continuing to plan on doing two upgrades per year until RTMA is replaced by RUA. Uh, and at that point, no, it, it may have to revert back to a single analysis, uh, upgrade every year, uh, but we'll see about that. Uh, and the other thing is that we'll, another major component of the estimated analysis uncertainty is the background error. And one thing that we'll definitely be working towards is using the hybrid ensemble uh, VAR which will provide substantially more variability in the background air, which will follow through directly into the variability in the estimated analysis uncertainty. Next slide. Uh, this is just a table that we were given from the FAA talking about their tolerances for different categories of, uh, for ceiling, for the low altitude, remote ops, those are the ones, those are the, uh, the helicopters and the, and the emergency medical flights. Uh, those standards are a little bit tighter than the ones in the middle column, which are for fixed wing uh, visual flight rules, and the last column, which is instrument flight rules. And then the bottom half of that table is for the conventional sensor data of temperature, wind, wind direction, pressure, and dew point. Uh, we're currently doing the temperature, and the other variables will be looking at as well. Uh, so one of the things we've promised to do in a couple of months after we've gotten the next upgrade of our TMA IRMA under our belt is to look at the um, estimate of analysis uncertainty and see if we can't calibrate it uh, relative to these tolerances. Next slide. So we've already heard uh, Stan talk about RUA. And our plans certainly call for moving R2MA IRMA from 2D to 3D. And uh, that will lead to improved cloud description, improved description of the planetary boundary layer. Uh, we'll get more of the MRMS data in, much more, uh, and more of the satellite data. Uh, it will mean that we will have a heavier dependence on the background, which for some folks, in terms of looking at an analysis of record, that isn't the best thing. But then you know, for those of us that do uh, analysis is a necessary thing. We, we can't do some of these things without a good, without a, a dependence on the background. Um, so the I already mentioned the hybrid ensemble VAR techniques. And what they will allow us to do, especially with respect to the radar data, is in the indirect quantities, is that we can get the cross covariances between, say, ref radar reflectivity and the divergence field or the um, that produces our hydrometeors. And of course, the, the, this is going to come with a price tag. And we do have to map out how that's going to fit in with all the other things that uh, folks want to use the supercomputers for. Uh, next slide. I'm just about done. This is just more information about the RUA that uh, and Stan already covered all of this. So I'm done. Five minutes over. Sorry. <laughs>